Would you take your Bible tonight, please, and turn to the book of Acts? We're going to look tonight at Acts chapter 17 for our text. And uh, we're very thankful to the Lord uh, for the privilege tonight to open the Word of God. And really, we want to enjoy the programs and the singing. But the focal point of the conference is really the preaching of God's Word. And so tonight, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 17. In just a moment, I'll begin reading uh, in verse number 16. We started 30 minutes early tonight, and that threw a few of you off, but most of you did fairly well. And uh, we have out at the uh, Walther Center afterwards, we have these food trucks out there tonight. And, uh, and so don't worry, we'll get out in time for the food trucks, but we're going to get the main meal right here, okay? And the Word of God. I had a friend that began keeping a diet journal uh, to help him regulate his eating. And uh, he wrote in his diet journal on day one, I have removed all of that bad, unhealthy, sugar-filled food from the house, and it was absolutely delicious. And so, if that's you, you're going to love those food trucks tonight. And uh, I hope you enjoy the fellowship out there as well. Acts chapter 17, and we're going to read, uh, beginning in verse 16, just uh, two or three verses for our scripture reading. We'll cover several more in the message tonight. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens... His spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. And certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him and said, What will this babbler say? And some said, and other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for our Lord Jesus, and we thank you for the resurrection. And Lord, it's because of the cross that we gather and sing. It's because of you, Lord, that we have the hope of eternal life in heaven. And it's for you that we gather this week. I believe every pastor here and every member of churches truly desires to be more greatly used of thee. And so, Lord, show us from your word how we might stand in this day and how we might testify for you. Help me as I preach tonight, Lord. Fill me with your spirit. Fill each listener with your spirit. And, God, may we leave this place willing to stand and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Several years ago, our son Larry was battling cancer, and many of you prayed for him during that time. Two terrible surgeries and several rounds of chemo. And in the middle of that entire difficult trial, the Lord put on my heart to talk to Larry about maybe something that he might like to do when the chemo was over, maybe uh, something he'd like to have as a gift or maybe some place he'd like to visit. And I believe it was Dr. Gibbs that suggested to me maybe just something to look ahead to during that very difficult hour in his life. And I didn't really know what Larry would say. I, I didn't know what he might like to receive or where he might like to go. And when I asked him the question, he said, you know, Dad, I'd really like to go to Athens. Now, I was thinking like Disneyland, <laughs> Knott's Perry Farm, you know. <laughs> but if you've ever watched a child suffer, he could have asked for the moon, and I would have tried to get alone and figure out how to make it happen. And, and I began to work on a trip to Athens. We began to study the missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul and how we might visit some of those sites and maybe learn together and As we approached the trip, I began to review some of the notes and the Word of God and in commentaries about this place, Athens. It was to Athens that the brethren of Berea sent the Apostle Paul when he was threatened by those who came from Thessalonica to take his life. And and, uh, it was at Athens where uh, we found the intellectual capital of the Mediterranean world at that time, and a very sophisticated city in some ways. uh, Yet it was a shrine to paganism. The central focal point of Athens, for those of you who've been there, is the Acropolis. 
about 500 feet above the rest of the city, crowned with the Parthenon, a place of wicked idolatry, a place where heathenism abounded. Demonic idolatry really lined the sky of Athens. When Paul visited there, the skyline was filled with all of these idols and temples dedicated to satanic worship. One ancient writer said that it was easier to find a god in Athens than to find men in Athens. They were so polytheistic. They had so many different gods. Some commentators say as many as 1,400 gods that they worshipped. And yet under the sovereign hand of God, the Apostle Paul walked into the city of Athens. G. Campbell Morgan said of that moment, the very conjunction of names is arresting. Athens, a sacred shrine of paganism, and Paul, the most faithful incarnation of the Christian passion. A man of God walked into Athens. Now Paul's fundamental concern in Athens was not cultural understanding or contextualization. His fundamental concern in Athens was the same concern every one of us should have for our city, and that was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul was fearlessly countercultural. His goal was not to reclaim the culture. His goal was to reclaim souls lost and on their way to hell without Jesus Christ. He walked into that city as God had ordained it in order that he might introduce the heathen pagan men and women of that city to the resurrected Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this passage, the apostle teaches us how a man of God engages a corrupt culture. Even in our own land, a nation established by so many wonderful Christian founders and men like Patrick Henry, who in the last line of his will said, I bequeath most of all to you my Christian faith and a relationship with Jesus Christ, which may be found in the New Testament of the Bible. He was not talking about the gods or a bunch of gods or a bunch of books or a bunch of potential Bibles. He was talking about the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And yet as America drifts further and further away from our Christian foundation, we can learn from the Apostle Paul how to stand in a corrupt culture, in a pagan culture, and be the voice that God has called us to be. I want you to notice in this passage tonight the spirit of a man of God. What is our spirit to be in this age? Is it to be a spirit of fear? Is it to be a spirit of anger? What was the spirit of this man? The Bible says in verse 16, Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. I want you to notice here, his heart was stirred. The city not only aroused his interest, but it aroused his emotion. He was not stirred by their philosophy nor by their art. He was stirred by their need for the Lord Jesus Christ. The word stirred indicates that he was provoked. There was a holy rage. There was a burning compassion when he saw this city wholly given to idolatry. Paul realized that men who worship everything are worshiping nothing. They may feel that they are academically superior because they know a little about many gods. They may worship everything, but in doing so, they actually are worshiping nothing. And the Bible says in Lamentations 3 and 51, Mine eye affecteth mine heart because of all the daughters of my city. And, and I believe as Paul saw uh, the lost in this city of Athens, uh, what he saw began to affect his heart. And I'm convinced today that the place to begin this conference is our heart condition as pastors. We have become so overwhelmed and so inundated in the information age and <clears throat> so much information crosses our desk and from the television and from all of the social media and so many burdens and so many problems in our churches that sometimes we are literally sitting around numb and unable to feel as we ought to feel as the men of God in this generation. That's why it's good to come apart to a conference like this and have our, our hearts refreshed and our vision renewed because sometimes we're frankly not stirred about things that ought to stir us up. 
And sometimes we get frustrated at liberal politicians and we get frustrated at, at marchers that carry their banners and, uh, and march against our police and march against good moral causes. And those things are frustrating. But the thing that ought to stir us up more than anything else is the fact that so many people have yet to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Those of you that drove here from Los Angeles, you drove through the city of Los Angeles, a city of four million people. Uh, and, and I thank the Lord there's no doubt several gospel preaching churches in that city, only four independent Baptist churches in that city. <clears throat> One for every million. Somebody needs to get stirred up about that. And it could be said of many cities in our nation, the great need that should be stirring us up tonight. The Lord has allowed me to see many great places and, and picturesque places in this world and some of you as well. And yet we need to learn how to look past the great wall of China and see the billions of people in need of the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And we need to look past the skyline of Manila and see that large Asian city filled with people who need the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to look past Big Ben and see a city of London that has a great spiritual vacuum tonight, a great need for Jesus Christ. We need to realize as we visit places like Brandenburg Gate where Ronald Reagan 30 years ago today said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall and thank God the wall came down and thank God the East Berliners came into West Berlin. But we did not match that coming into the West with a commensurate amount of gospel preaching and missionaries, and I'm telling you, we've got to get stirred more uh, about uh, the architect than the architecture. We ought to be stirred about the lost and dying who need the Lord Jesus Christ. Some studies indicate that American Christians gave less last year to missions than this country spent on Halloween. Pet food. Somewhere along the way, we lost our passion. I'm not being critical. I'm in the corner of pastors, but I meet a lot of pastors today just going through the motions, just kind of just kind of doing a sermon and maybe a warmed up sermon and kind of dutifully making some visits and you try to call and it's an answer machine and you can't can't get a hold of them and there's not a lot of passion for soul winning. There's passion for, you know, this conference and that conference, those types of things and and meetings and and uh, what we see on Twitter and sports teams and and so forth, but there doesn't seem to be the burning passion. I mean, I hear pastors talk about 401k's and retirements and golf scores and I hear them talk about these things but I really believe it's time that we got stirred up again and started rescuing the perishing and caring for the dying of our cities Paul was stirred some men attend conferences to get ideas some attend to find what's wrong so they can feel better about their own failure But somewhere in this auditorium tonight, there are some preachers aching to see more people saved in their city. Preachers like Curtis Hudson, who heard Dr. John R. Rice preach about soul winning. He was a part-time pastor, a postal worker, and he heard a message about leading people to Christ, and he'd never quite heard about that, and he'd never really seen that happen exactly that way, and something began to stir and burn in his heart, and, and he began to go out and practice this idea of sitting down in people's houses and telling them that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that Jesus Christ came in order that they might have salvation, and he began to go from house to house and, and leading people to Christ, and one house and another house, and before you know it, some years later, he was pastoring the largest church in the state of Georgia. Hey, he didn't start out trying to build the largest church in the state of Georgia. He just wanted to help one person after another person know that they didn't have to go to hell. They could spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. We need some men tonight to leave this conference stirred in their heart. His heart was stirred. I want you to notice, secondly, his spirit was pressed. The Bible says in Acts 18 and verse 5, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in his spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Chapter 18 tells, uh, 
tells about this moment in Corinth. And again, he comes to a city, if you've been there, given over to paganism, a city that had no knowledge of Jesus Christ. And now the word in the Bible is the word pressed. It means that he was constrained. He was held in his heart. His compulsion was internal. It was in his own spirit. And I'm going to tell you something. When you get pressed in your heart, and when you get a burden in your heart for the people of your city, and you get a burden for the teenagers, and you get a burden for the gangbangers, and you get a burden for the homeless, and you get a burden for that man that's got a good job and a nice car but his life's going down the tube spiritually and he doesn't know God listen no one's going to have to tell you you have to go soul winning no one's going to have to make a worker standard for you no one's going to have to put a guilt trip on you hey when you get pressed and when you get stirred you've got to tell people about Jesus Christ Paul was a man pressed in his spirit. He was a man stirred in his spirit. 1 Corinthians 9 and 16, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He said, there's nothing else I'd rather do. There's nothing else I had better do. I must preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. May our hearts tonight be stirred. May we think of the streets of our own cities and the people of our own cities who need the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you recognize tonight that people still worship the God of Athene, the mental God of humanism? There are many today, many in our public school system, many who believe that they are their own God. The gods of Athens are still with us today. Many people still worship the god Demeter, Mother Earth. Many people still worship the god Zeus, the the god of force. May the force be with you, so they say. False religion is everywhere, but where are the stirred up men of God standing in the middle of false religion and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ? Where are the leaders? Where are the compassionate leaders? Many times they are quiet, content, sometimes gossiping, sometimes rabble-rousing, many times relaxed, but not often enough getting out with the gospel and telling people one at a time, as the Apostle Paul did, how they might know Christ as their Savior. I'm simply saying we need to say tonight, Lord, stir me up. Lord, help me. Forgive me for being numb. Forgive me for getting more excited about a ball game than I do about soul winning God. Forgive me about being more interested about uh, the finances of the church than the spiritual condition of the church. God, stir my heart once again for lost souls. 31 years ago, Terry and I came to this town. We had no salary, no medical insurance. Twelve people asked asked if we would come. They voted for us unanimously to come. I was the youth pastor, the janitor, cut the grass on Saturday. I didn't know a lot about maintenance. I just always poured pine saw in all the toilets every Saturday night, so it smelled good at least. That was my theory of it. I was a song leader and the music was good. I don't read notes to this very day. I just said sing loud. That's all we did. We sang loud. I knew how to lead two songs, Victory in Jesus and at Calvary. We sang them every single time we had church. We didn't have money to buy tracks. We didn't have a computer. We had a phone, but I didn't know where it was. There was one thing that we had. We had a passion to see people come to Christ. Terry and I remember taking our children, getting in our little station wagon and going up here above Palmdale Lake. Some of you drove by that little lake, that that large body of water on the right as you come into the Antelope Valley there. And we'd get up there on that mountaintop, and we'd, at nighttime, we'd look out over Lancaster and Palmdale, and we'd see the lights, and we would pray, God, behind every one of those lights, there's a family that needs Jesus. Every one of those lights represents souls that need you, Lord. Help us to have a heart of compassion for this community. God, help us to have souls saved this Sunday. For 16 months, I knocked on 500 doors a week telling people from house to house about Jesus Christ and going from house to house and place to place and everywhere we went just trying somehow to tell people about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I know uh, that the devil tries to drown that fire out and I know he tries to douse out your, your excitement for the things of God, but I'm simply saying it all really is going to begin with your spirit. You see, everything begins with an attitude. 
the way you started this service tonight will in many ways determine what you get out of this service. Everything begins with a particular kind of an attitude and a particular kind of a spirit. And Paul's spirit was a stirred spirit. It was a passionate spirit. But notice not only the spirit of the man of God tonight. Notice, secondly, the strategy of the man of God. The Bible says in verse 17 these words, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. The actions of a man are the best interpreters of his thoughts. The reason we know that he really was stirred up, the reason we know it wasn't just a message or a a talk that he gave, the reason we know he really cared for the souls of men was because the Bible indicates for us that he began to go out and engage them and talk to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. In fact, he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. And so we see that his strategy involved, first of all, the, the proclamation of the gospel, the proclamation of his ministry. Dr. Curtis Hudson, a dear friend and mentor to many of us and to me in particular, often said the only alternative to soul winning is disobedience. In other words, Paul would have felt disobedient to his calling to not preach Christ. He didn't know how long he would be in Athens. He didn't know what was going to happen in Athens. He didn't know anybody at Athens. He was was there waiting because some people were trying to kill him back at the last place. He didn't know how long he'd be there, but he knew that God had a reason for sending him there. May I remind you, God may have you talk to somebody at a hotel or a restaurant or an airport, even on this trip, so that you can tell them about Jesus Christ. Paul realized that there was a proclamation to be made. And verse 17 says, Therefore disputed he in the synagogue. I want you to notice, first of all, he reasoned with people. The word disputed means that he conversed. He, he argued in a form of exhortation with them. He was able to debate with them reasonably why he believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh the reason of the hope that, that is within you with meekness and fear. God says, hey, I want you to be ready, preacher. I want you to be ready, Christian, at any moment to give an answer to someone that wants to know about the true God. We're to be ready at a moment's notice to tell this world about the Lord Jesus Christ. It is insufficient For our youth groups and adult Sunday school classes to focus on entertainment and simple devotional thoughts anymore. We must train our children for war. We must train them to stand as soldiers in a spiritual battle. We dare not send them out into the public. We dare not send them out to a public university unless they are armed with the sword of the Word of God. We cannot send them out uh, with rubber swords and plastic armor. We cannot think that we're going to build them spiritually simply with games and, and, uh, and songs and little devotionals here and there. They must know the truth of the Word of God. And some of us tonight need to stop playing games and get back to teaching our young and teaching our people how to reason in the marketplace concerning the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look it. We as unaffiliated Baptists are good at teaching moralism. We have a lot of lists. Lists are okay. If you have a Christian school, Bible college, we've got tons of lists. And if you're the type that has to know about all the lists before you give something credibility, then see me after church and we'll compare lists. Lists are okay. But what we must teach our young people is the transformational power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how to rightly divide the word of truth. And we need to attach those lists to a Bible principle so that they're not leaving our churches with just a list of what we told them is right, but they're leaving with an understanding of the word of God and how to stand on the word of God in their generation. Paul reasoned with them. He gave them the argument for the Christian faith. His apologetics were strong. His doctrine, true. He was able to reason. And then, of course, secondly, he preached to them. The Bible says in verse number 18, certain of the philosophers of the Epicureans and and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, what will this babbler say? And some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 and 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. 
There is a need today for the old-fashioned preaching of the Word of God. And somehow we're being duped into the idea that we're not going to reach our generation unless we sing them to Jesus and entertain them to Jesus and coddle them to Jesus and, and, uh, and discuss them to Jesus. Hey, there's a place for all these things, but God has chosen. I said, God has chosen the foolishness of preaching to confound the wise. And the Apostle Paul was a one man, uh, in, uh, one individual in Athens, but he was willing to hazard it all and to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. For after the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. God said to Timothy, as Paul wrote to him in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, preach the word, he said, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Ladies and gentlemen, may we never cower, may we never apologize for preaching the truth of the word of God. You know the Greek word just as I do, it is the word karuk. It means to declare it, to boldly declare what the Bible says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Our vice mayor is here tonight. I remember back in the day, we used to have our elected officials come, and the, our, back when George Runner was a council member. And I'll be honest with you, I was a young pastor. I'm still a very young pastor, really, you know, truth be told, but and I'd get nervous. Here were the elected officials. Remember, remember Mike Antonovich came. Some, by the way, some of these men turned out to be Christians. I remember I had Dr. Hudson come one time to preach, and we had the base commander come to the church that morning. I said, Dr. Hudson, what do you do with someone like you're a general? They come to your church. We're running about 200. I mean, he filled out a card. Dr. Hudson looked me in the eye. He said, Paul? You go to his home and tell him about Jesus Christ like you would any other sinner that visits your church. That may be why they got baptized two weeks later, he and his wife. Sometimes we get a little bit nervous because we're afraid of how we might be perceived. There's this whole tendency to kind of want to be more understood. My goal in ministry is not that you would understand more about me or like me. That's wonderful. My real goal is that you might understand more about Jesus and turn to Jesus Christ as your Savior. And Paul the Apostle proclaimed these truths. I remember when Steve went to be with the Lord, Tanya. I was preaching for Brother Cruz on a Monday night in North Carolina. I flew back in to prepare for the service and... There was a lot of planning to be done, and I was talking with various different folks from the sheriff's department, and they were talking about different aspects of the service and protocols. And I saw Tanya back in the back there. You might remember that day you had a ball cap on. I didn't recognize you at first, and she was just there, kind of making sure things were right. And I said, is there anything that I can do for you? Is there anything you want for the service tomorrow? We'd already had that conversation, but... I, Wanted to double check. I'll never forget what you said. She said, really, I have two requests. Number one, I request that Jerry Brown does not speak in this service. He sat like an angry little boy right over here the entire time. And number two, she said, and I request that you preach the gospel so that everybody there knows how to have Jesus Christ as their Savior. She said, my husband's team, they need to know Christ. His friends, they need to know Christ. And God began to work, and these buildings and other buildings began to fill up with various different men from all over the state and women from various different departments and came from different parts of the country. And by God's plan, it was televised, not just a few parts of that service, the entire service. And because of the testimony of this dear family, because of the testimony of Tanya's husband, I had such freedom to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all over this auditorium, when the time was given to receive Christ and to lift your hand, if you've accepted Christ as Savior, hands went up all over this auditorium. Hands went up outside where the large screens were and in the north auditorium. People began to call into the church and said, we were watching on television and we heard the man say to pray and ask Jesus as Savior. And we said that prayer, what do we do next? 
One of our men was out at NASA. He'd been witnessing to a friend for years. The man had never been saved, and and, uh, he had tried so many times to talk to him, and for some reason, out at Edwards Air Force Base, they watched the entire funeral service, and when the time came to pray and ask Jesus, our member said to his friend, would you like to pray and do that? He led his friend to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. One of our members, a junior high teacher, they showed the entire service in a junior high school, and when it came time to pray the gospel prayer, he said, Pastor, I'll never never forget what I saw. He said, said, I saw seven junior hires bow their head and out loud pray and ask Jesus Christ to come in and be their Savior. Listen, I'm thankful today uh, for people like this dear woman here who recognizes, listen, this is an opportunity to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't need poetry today. They don't just need a song today. They don't just need some testimonials today. They need Jesus today. And I'm telling you, my friend, we must stand and we must preach Jesus Christ in our community with every opportunity never being ashamed of the death the burial and the resurrection and in this polytheistic day and in this day of multiculturalism may we never be ashamed to preach what Jesus said I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father except by me last week there was a Christian man being interviewed I think for a position in some form of the government, maybe a judge and he was being interviewed by Bernie Sanders Bernie Sanders said to him, now I've read your resume here. It says you're a Christian. It says you believe that people who are Islamic are condemned. He says, is that what you believe? The man was very kind. I've seen the video. He said, sir, I'm a Christian. I believe we're all created in the image of God. I believe that God loves everyone, but as a Christian, I believe that Jesus Christ is the way to salvation. And the sinner began to yell at him and scream at him and tell him that he was unfit to be involved uh, as a judge's assistant because of his Christian faith. Never mind the fact that the Muslim faith believes that if we do not accept Allah, then we are condemned ourselves. You see, it's kind of a one-way thing, isn't it? And the man was screamed at just because he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. You may be screamed at. You may have someone walk out of your service. You may have someone write a mean letter to the editor. Not just preachers. I'm talking about even people from your city might write things like that. Paul the Apostle teaches us to proclaim the truth in a pagan culture. The proclamation of his ministry. Notice, secondly, the location of his ministry. Verse 17. The Bible tells us, first of all, that he went to the synagogue. We gather here tonight with fellow believers, and it's such a blessing. But we see the Apostle Paul took the gospel to three different venues out in the public square. Reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and God-fearing Gentiles. There's no response recorded there. Then he goes to the market, the Agora, downtown. And here they thought he was a setter forth of, of strange gods. And then uh, he went to the Areopagus. And there at Mars Hill, he confronts the Stoics and the Epicureans. And, and, and what, I'm, what I'm seeing here from the Apostle Paul is his willingness to get out where the people were. Get out into the marketplace with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes we like our holy huddles. And sometimes... We like meetings like this, and and, and we like to talk about all the problems at our church house and all of the different situations can be discussed. But listen, uh, as the songwriter said, my house is full, but my fields are empty, he said. And Paul teaches us to go out into the marketplace. He spoke to the Stoics who were pantheists, who were just kind of enduring life, and nature was their God. Back in the 1980s, a survey was done that said one in ten Americans described themselves as an atheist or as an agnostic or as a nun. Today, it's 25% of Americans following the way of the Epicurean, seeking pleasure, having a good time. If it feels good, do it. Hey, if it doesn't bother anyone else, whatever. And Paul went right into their front yard and preached to them that they needed to turn to Jesus Christ, the the Stoics and and the Epicureans. The Epicureans were more atheistic and desiring pleasure, and yet they were all rejecting the truth of Christ, and many of them not knowing the truth of Christ. The Bible tells us about this culture in chapter 17 and verse 21. It says, For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. I think they must have had Facebook back then. I'm not sure. (laughs) These people went to Mars Hill and they just talked about some new thing. They wanted to hear a new thing, tell a new thing. There's 4 million likes on Facebook every 60 seconds. 
And you know, the fact is, if you're going to spend that much time on Facebook, maybe you ought to start liking Jesus out there in the social media. Instead of putting your maiden name and all your favorite, you know, old time songs and all your this and that and all, why don't you start it right off with, I am a Christian, I love Jesus Christ as my Savior. And Paul went right into the middle of this seeking culture and there his strategy was to preach the gospel in the public place we see his spirit was stirred we see his strategy was to go out but notice thirdly the sermon of the man of God what did he say to this city I can almost sense the bounce in his step as he walked up Mars Hill I just have this picture in my mind that Paul went to the synagogue not a lot of action there went to the market not a lot of action there now he goes up these very steps. This is where they talked about the issues. This is where uh, he would have the opportunity. And, and it was four centuries earlier that Socrates had passed up these same steps. And now he would go there uh, to this place of worldly wisdom. And he would preach to them the wisdom and the riches of Jesus Christ. Hey, if you ever get tired of preaching, if you ever lose the joy, if you ever lose the bounce in your step on Sunday morning, that you get to proclaim Jesus Christ, you need to get something stirred up in your heart. It wasn't his job. It wasn't his duty. He wasn't doing it to look right. He was doing it because God had put a stirring in his heart. And notice his message beginning in verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. He just kind of got with it, didn't he? He didn't say, I'm glad to be here in your fair city. He said, I perceive that you are too superstitious. And he begins to teach them about the presence of the one true God. Notice he says in verse 22, he says you are superstitious. Verse 23, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him, I declare unto you. Here we see that every pagan temple illustrated to Paul man's need to know the true God. They all were pointing to the fact that they needed the Lord Jesus Christ. And he begins to attach to his message the truths concerning the one true God and the illusion of many religions. And he uses these terms superstitious and he speaks about the fact that they even had this unknown God just in case maybe they missed one. Like many other religions of the day in various different countries of the the world superstitious many gods polytheistic and I can I can imagine in my mind as he walked up, up Mars Hill I can see him walking by the table where they sold the coexist stickers and another flag a table with the rainbow flag and I can see him as he walks by the ecumenical gathering there, the, the Wiccans holding hands with the, this one and that one, and all of them kind of gathered there just to discuss stuff. And he said, you know, as I look around, I sense we have a problem here. We're worshiping everything, but in reality, we're worshiping nothing. We're too superstitious, but we don't know the one true God. The other day I was out soul winning with Brother Hauk, and we knocked on a man's door, and we were trying to talk to him about the Lord. He said, hey guys, listen, he said, I'm very spiritual. And I don't know if I should have said it just this quickly, but I said, so's the devil. <laughs> the Bible says the devil believes God and trembles. I mean, he's even emotional about it. We don't need America to become more religious or more spiritual. We must preach Christ crucified and risen again and coming again. And he begins preaching to them the true God. The world's fastest growing religion is Islam. From 2010 to 2050, it's projected to grow 73%. Compared to Christianity, 35%. May we recognize tonight that there are people, instead of turning to Christ, just saying, well, all roads lead to the same place. My friend, all roads do not lead to the same place. The illusion of many religions. And then he gives them the identity of the true God. Notice in verse 24. God that made the world. God that made the world and all things therein. Seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth. 
dwelleth not in temples made with hands. This is the message that is needed in India, in Africa. This is the message that is needed in America. The identity of the true God, God that made the world. There is a God who is both the sovereign creator of the universe and the sovereign ruler of the universe. Not only does he exist, but he is knowable and he has revealed himself to man. And this is where we must begin in a culture where many of our children growing up in this culture do not know even Adam and Eve. They don't know about the Bible, the book of Genesis. They've never really understood the meaning of Christmas. We must begin here that there is a God. That God made the world and He is the Lord of the world. And that He has revealed Himself to us. And that the Word, John 1.14, was made flesh. The eternal Word, Jesus Christ. He did not begin His existence in Bethlehem's manger. Uh, he did not uh, simply start there. But as the eternal Word, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And we must teach this generation that there is a God and that He may be known and that He has revealed Himself and that he has dwelt among us and that he uh, was a virgin born son of God and that he was a sinless son of God and that he was tempted in all points like as we are yet he never, never one time sinned and, and we must help this world to understand that Jesus Christ is more uh, than uh, a, a, an author or a speaker or a healer or a good man but that he is God incarnate and that he came down to us he is God revealed to us in the beginning God he is not a distant God God. He is not divorced from His creation. He is not uh, in man-made temples. He is not locked in His creation. He is great and powerful, but not too great to be connected and concerned about man's needs. And we must come back to the basic in this hour that there is a God who wants to know us, who loves us, and who died to save us. The external evidence points to Him. Psalm 19 and 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth His handiwork. The teleological argument points to Him. A plan requires a planner. A program requires a programmer. A design requires a designer. The world clearly exhibits design. The world definitely has a designer. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? This world that is becoming more agnostic, atheistic, more and more nuns, they need to be confronted with the fact that irrespective of what they've heard in some religious comparative class, that there is a God, He is a Creator God, He is the Savior God, and He wants a relationship with them. There was an atheist walking through the woods admiring all the accidents that Evolution had created. <laughs> what majestic trees, what powerful rivers, what beautiful animals, he said to himself. And as he walked alongside the river, he heard a rustling in the bushes. And he turned to look, he saw a seven-foot grizzly bear charging toward him. He ran as fast as he could, but he wasn't escaping. He looked over his shoulder, he saw the grizzly closing, somehow he ran even faster, but uh, tears began to come to his eyes. He looked again, the bear was ever closer, his heart was pounding, he tried to run faster. Uh, finally, uh, he tripped and fell to the ground, he rolled over to pick himself up, but as he did, he saw the bear was right over him with his paw ready to come down on him, and in that instant, the atheist cried, oh God! Time stopped, the bear froze, the forest was silent. The river stopped moving. A bright line shone, sh light shone down upon the man. A voice came out of the sky. You deny my existence for all these years. You teach others that I don't exist and even credit creation to a cosmic accident. Do you expect me to help you out of this predicament? Am I to count you as a believer? The atheist looked directly into the light and said, I would feel like a hypocrite to become a Christian at this point in my life, but perhaps you could make the bear a Christian. Very well, said the voice. The light went out. The river ran. The sounds of the forest resumed. The bear dropped his right paw, brought both paws together, 
and spoke out loud, Lord, for this food that I'm about to receive, I'm truly thankful. This world has been duped with the lie of Satan that there is no God, that we are here by accident, that there will be no day of judgment, that there will be no day of reckoning. The devil is a liar and the father of all lies and God has given us the truth and he has told us to buy the truth and sell it not. He's told us not to remove the ancient landmarks. He has told us to preach the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ and we've got to go out into this culture and preach the truth of a living God who loves and died for this world. He taught them of the presence of the true God, and then he taught them of the power of this true God. Notice, if you would, in verse 24, he says, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. We have taught a generation of young Americans that they came from monkeys, and now we see the result of it. animal life. We have taught them that they came from monkeys, that there are no absolutes. You can be whatever you want to be. If you think you're something else, just pretend, and it's okay. A little girl asked her mother, Mother, where did people first come from? The mother said, Well, God made Adam and Eve, and they had children and grandchildren, and on and on and on. A few days later, she asked her father, she said, Dad, where, where did... Where did people first come from? And Dad said, well, many years ago there were monkeys and, you know, and we kind of evolved. And he kind of told that story some of you have heard, you know, about the one-celled amoeba and how that it was floating around in the ocean for millions and millions of years. And finally, finally, it kind of got washed up onto the seashore. And after millions and millions of years, it kind of popped out some arms and popped out some legs. And after a while, it popped out a tail. And millions and millions of years later, it was kind of flying from limb to limb in the forest. And one day is tail broke and he fell down, fell on his head and woke up and he was a professor at USC. And the father told a story, something like that, to the little boy that they'd all come from monkeys and the girl was confused and she went to her mom. She said, Mom, you said God made us and Dad said we came from monkeys and the mother answered. She said, well, dear, that's very simple. I told you about my side of the family. He told you about his side of the family. The Lord of heaven and earth. Henry Morris, speaking against the theory of evolution, often mentioned the second law of thermodynamics. Many of you have studied it. One of the most well-established principles of science, stating the natural tendency for things to go from a more ordered to a less ordered state. Noted atheist Isaac Asimov acknowledged that as far as we know, all changes are in the direction of, a direction of increasing entropy, increasing disorder, increasing randomness, of running down. Yet, incredibly, evolutionists argue that exactly the opposite is what is happening today. Hey, somebody's got to stand in the face of this nuttiness and proclaim that we are a God of a God that is a God with a design and a God with order and a God with power and a God with love. For by Him, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. We can't continue having our little holy huddles and our little gatherings with believers unless those gatherings are stirring us up to go out uh, to the fairgrounds and out to the vegetable market and out to the streets and out to the neighbor and telling them there is a God who loves them, who created them, and who has a purpose for their life. And so we see God's power in His creation and then God's lordship over His creation. Notice in seven, chapter 17 and verse 25, Neither is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, seeing He giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. 
Paul is simply saying he is the sovereign life giver. He is over history. He is over geography. He is the governor of the universe. Daniel said, Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heavens hath given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. Paul even says in verse number 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also of his offspring. Here in verse 28, Paul cites some of the Greek poets, some that he perhaps had been familiar with as a child. He contextualizes here for a moment from their culture. He tells them that even their poets acknowledge the revelation of God in nature, though they wrongly saw it as a revelation of false gods, that they at least were understanding that there was some higher power. And he uses this illustration. He contextualizes by using these poets. Some may argue the association argument. He should not have done that. I believe what he was doing was trying to help them understand the gospel, the power of God, the fact that there is a creator God. May I say tonight that over-contextualization will develop a worldly church? If the goal of the preacher is that everything must be tied to the culture and every illustration from the latest movie and the latest fad, and if the goal of the preacher is that everything must somehow resemble the world, over-contextualization will develop a worldly church. But may I also say that under-contextualization develops a church that no one understands. Like preaching in Latin. It's okay to use an illustration from some things in our culture, an athletic illustration or something like that. But may these never be the main things. This certainly was not Paul's main thing. Redeeming something from the culture was not his goal. If it helped in a small way to illustrate the existence of God, then so be it. But his ultimate goal was to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. The presence of the true God. His second point, the power of the true God. And finally tonight, the provision of the true God. Why did this God who created us come? Why did He come to us? What is His purpose for life? Verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because He hath appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained, whereof He hath given assurance unto all men, in that He hath raised him from the dead. Now many commentators writing about Acts 17 speak of Paul's gracious, somewhat conciliatory manner, conversational style. But make no mistake, his message was clear. After all, it was a message calling these men to turn from their ignorance to turn from worshiping stone gods who have ears that cannot hear and eyes that cannot see and to repent. To turn from this to this. Sometimes we get worried about people who speak of repentance to a point of works for salvation. Of course that's a silly extreme, but may I tell you that when someone trusts Jesus Christ as their Savior, they are turning to Him and trusting in Him alone to take them to heaven to forgive their sin. And when Paul comes to the conclusion of this message, he doesn't say, hey, if you want to keep some of the gods in the God house, and here's what you can do. You can just put Jesus up on your God shelf and believe in all these other gods and believe in Jesus too and it'll all be okay. And that was not the answer. The answer was that it's time to burn the God house and it's time to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see it in Thessalonica. They turn from their idols to serve the living and the true God. Testifying Acts 20:21 20, both to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And when a man realizes how he's been duped and how silly he's been in false religion and he realizes that Jesus is the true God and the creator of the world and that he's been a sinner. Listen, there's going to be a turning. There's going to be a conviction about Christ. He's going to turn to Christ and be saved by faith through grace. And so it was that the provision of the true God was shown. And we see in this passage that when someone turns to the true God, they will have salvation from judgment. Notice this in verse 30. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now He's commanding all men everywhere to repent because He hath appointed a day. He hath appointed a day in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained. Now folks, Jesus Christ is Creator 
He's the lover of souls. He's the great shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. He's the lily of the valley. We could go all night with the superlatives of our Savior's wonder. But may I remind you tonight, He is the judge of this world. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says that in the which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained. John's Gospel, chapter 5, For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. I am afraid that in this culturally sensitive day of ministry, I'm afraid that in this seeker sensitive day of ministry, we are afraid to preach about the reality of hell, the reality of judgment, the reality of standing before the Lord Jesus Christ. And hey, folks can sit around all day long who've never pastored five minutes in California and they can try to look at ministry here and say, oh, they must cut this back or that back. You can ask this choir full of people. They go to a church where the pastor on Sunday morning still preaches heaven sweet and hell hot, still preaches that there's a day of judgment coming and that the only way to escape that judgment is by coming to Jesus Christ as Savior. Folks, we don't write it. We just recite it. He's the judge, but the good news is he's the Savior. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He wants all men to come to repentance. He's not willing that any should perish. 1 Corinthians 1.18 For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved. It is the power of God when a man comes to Jesus Christ and repents of his sin and says, Lord, I'm turning to you as my Savior according to the Word of God. He is saved, the Bible says, by the power of God. And so it is. He is the Savior. God has provided salvation. And then notice finally in verse 31 what Paul says. He says, Whereof he hath given an assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And I know folks can be skeptical all day long and as you have these dialogues and conversations at Starbucks and at someone's home and at work and wherever it might be, they're going to wince at the thought of a judgment. They're going to say it's too narrow just believing on Jesus. That's too narrow. It's about this narrow right here. But there's a final argument to the question, and that is the empty tomb. This is what we read in the Scripture, verse 31. He hath raised him from the dead. Oh, they took him from the cross. They took him to the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Many of us have visited that site, perhaps where Jesus was laid, where there's an extra carving made out so that his body could be laid. The soldiers were placed there to watch. But nothing was going to stop what happened on that third day as the ground began to shake and as God determined that on that third day up from the grave Jesus Christ arose with a mighty triumph for His foes. And my friend, uh, you can visit various tombs in the world and you're going to find when you visit there whether it's uh, at Westminster Abbey the bones of the notables. You're going to find in various different places the bones of the founders of religions. But when you come to the grave of Jesus Christ it is empty my friend. And that that message needs to be preached in our nation once again. I get weary with preachers who don't preach the gospel at Easter. Hello. When you're too cool to preach the resurrection at Easter, you're just messed up. But we ought to preach it every Sunday morning too. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. So as a man, I came out to California and hear Brother Chapel preach and go to this conference. He's preaching about the death, burial, and resurrection. Paul the Apostle is telling us what needs to be done in our Athens, in our city. These men and women and boys and girls of this day need to know that our hope is not in this life only. If it was in this life only, we would of all men be most miserable. Our hope is in the next life to come. And so we come to verse 33 and we read these simple words. So Paul departed from among them. He departs Athens alone. And those whose goal is church growth would seem that he was a failure. Not a lot happened. But what did happen was a man of God 
was a voice for God in a city that needed God. And we see in verse 34 that while some rejected, some men clave unto Him and believed. And we read later in history annals, the records tell us that there were many martyrs for Jesus Christ who stood in the city of Athens and who gave their life for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, the seed had been sown. Paul was faithful. And it is required of a steward that a man may be found faithful. And you may, Pastor, 20 or 200 or 2,000 or 20,000. That's not the point of it tonight. The point is that in your Athens, be the voice for Jesus Christ. Never be ashamed of Jesus Christ. In the marketplace, in the synagogue, uh, on Mars Hill, wherever you might be, stand up for Jesus Christ. William Carey was a poor cobbler in England. His father was a Church of England minister. But after William Carey was saved, he joined a Baptist church and began preaching. Carey became passionate about preaching, and somehow he became burdened about people in other countries besides England. One day at a preacher's meeting, he stood and brought a speech on worldwide evangelization and the need for other people groups to hear about Jesus. One older preacher stood up and said, young man, sit down. God is pleased to con- when God is pleased to convert the heathen world, He will do it without your help or mine. Time does not allow me to conjecture on his theological treaties or his place of education. My mind wanders when I hear of someone who says, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And with a very fatalistic swipe, shot down William Carey's passion for that moment. But something kept burning in his heart for the lost. He wasn't going to let some old crotchety man that didn't care about souls throw water on his fire for the lost. Something was stirring in him. Something was building in him. William Carey, as many of you know, finally found his way into the part of India near to Bangladesh. And as he went to India, he began there preaching the gospel. Terry and I went over a few years ago to Regents Park College in Oxford, and there, as we went in, we began to look at some of the missionary archives of the Mission Society, the Baptist Society for Missions. Notice what the name of it was, the Baptist Society for Propagating the Gospel Amongst the Heathen. We took the files in our hands that contained the original minutes from the 1790s. We were privileged to have the letters of William Carey, We began to read those letters, and as we did, we discovered that for seven years there were no converts. In his Athens, in his place with many gods, no one wanted Jesus Christ. During the time that he was there, because of being away from home, because of the differences of culture, his wife became insane. Many times while he preached, she would stand in the back and scream at him. Some of you say, mine does that, and she's not insane. That's an, I, I don't have time to cover that right now. We'll cover that in a session tomorrow. His first son, Peter, died in India. We continued reading through the journals. One son backslid. Got involved in alcohol. That's when the criticism came from the other missionaries. When are we going to learn to pray for one another? (laughs) Oh, I knew it. I mean, the man wrote letters. We held them in our hands talking about how the other missionaries were criticizing this man who'd lost his son who was trying to reach people for Christ. But something happened in the seventh year. (laughs) Somebody had the truth of the gospel dawn in their heart. And they realized that pagan temples, that worshiping everything meant worshiping nothing. And they turned and they put their faith in this God-man named Jesus Christ. And he was baptized. And many more were baptized. And 7,000 were baptized. 
And the scriptures were translated into 30 different languages. And the Sarampur College was established. And it's still there today teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And William Carey became known for that famous saying, Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. Expect great things from God and attempt great things for God. By the way, that's what I'm praying for in this conference. And I told the Lord when He speaks to my heart and He lays something on my heart, something crazy like starting a Christian school or starting a bus route or starting more bus routes or or building a building, something really crazy that I want to be willing to do whatever God wants me to do. It was crazy when this church started supporting two missionaries. I wasn't even on salary yet. But I believe that's one of the reasons God's blessed this church. It was crazy to start building a building when we were running a hundred people. It was crazy. And you know, it's an amazing thing, $64 million later, as we've been through these building programs, it's just as hard, it takes just as much faith to build something else, it takes just as much faith to hire another staff member, just enough, enough, uh, more faith to, uh, to maybe develop another bus ministry or, or launch out and support some more missionaries, but we've invited 20 more this October, 20 brand new missionaries to come. Why? Because we want to expect great things from God, and we want to attempt great things for God, and we didn't try to build this church to a place where we would be comfortable and could pat ourselves on the back and had a salary and had this and that and we could enjoy nice music and padded pews. Hey, we came to this place today so that we might be encouraged to win more people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And William Carey kept telling these young missionaries, Expect great things from God. Attempt great things for God. And I'm saying tonight we can reach this culture for Christ. We can still see people saved and ministries challenged and built. And we can see families restored to God. It can be done if we'll stop complaining and arguing and tweeting against soul winning King James Bible preaching men. And if we'll get back out to Athens and do what we're supposed to do and say what we're supposed to say. It can be done in America still if we'll stand with stirred hearts and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and may God stir our hearts tonight may God send us out into the marketplace and onto the hilltops with the gospel and may we expect great things from God and attempt great things for God and I don't care if you're a millennial pastor 28 years old I don't care if you're a baby boomer pastor or a grandpa or like my friend over here brother Henry Hearns an 80 year old preacher I don't care how old you are I don't care what background you're from I don't care what college you're from or if you didn't even go to Bible college what I want to know tonight do you love God do you love the brethren do you want to go to the marketplace do you have a burden for souls do you want to change your generation or sit around complaining about your generation do you want to expect great things from God do you want to attempt great things for God I mean, there's got to be another church that needs to be planted in your area. There's got to be another neighborhood that needs to be saturated. I'm saying tonight, ask God to stir your heart. Ask God to send you out into the marketplace. There ought to be some men in this room tonight. You ought to surrender your life to be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You ought to get to a Bible college where you can see the modeling and receive the mentoring. Paul said, those things that you have both received and heard and believed and seen in me, do. And you ought to get around a preacher. You ought to get around a place where you can be trained and where you can get out and get involved in the ministry for the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be that God would let you stop making widgets and start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, my friend, tonight we need the spirit of William Carey. We need the spirit of the Apostle Paul to simply say, yeah, the culture's changing, but the darker the night, the brighter the light. And I'm going to expect great things for God this year. My ministry vision is not hold on till the end. And I'm going to attempt great things for God. You ought to be so excited and you ought to have such vision that your folks get a little nervous when you get home. My goal is to keep these folks nervous all the time. When I said a minute ago, God's given me a willingness to build another, start another, do another. Thank God for a church that says, Whatever the Lord putting on your heart, preacher, let's get it done. And if you're here as an assistant pastor or a layman, God puts on your pastor's heart some big, bold vision this week, would you say, Pastor, as the Lord put it on your heart, I'm with you. 
I want to help you. We can reach this culture. May God stir us. May God give us the right strategy. May we stick with the right sermon. And God will do the rest.